<laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, I'm Brianne Kimmel. I am on the growth team at Zendesk. I'm Anthony Mardell. I lead partnerships at Trello. And tonight, we're going to spend some time talking about customer feedback. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on me. Um, I actually come from a non-technical background. Um, I actually studied journalism and mass communication. And um, throughout my studies, I was very interested in consumer behavior and got very interested in um, basically uh, analysis, customer analysis. So that sort of spun into more of a, a technical appetite. Um, I led performance marketing um, for Expedia for a while and then transitioned into a product manager role um, on the growth team. And I actually started my career in Sydney, which is sort of my fun fact. So I moved to Sydney after university. Uh, I was supposed to stay for, I think, two months. And I ended up staying for about four and a half years. So love the city of Sydney. And uh, currently, Living uh, in San Francisco, working at Zendesk, um, like I mentioned, I'm on the growth team. And currently, I'm working on building a program for startups. Cool. Um, so I'm Anthony. Uh, like I said, I lead partnerships at Trello. Um, I'm kind of mirroring um, Brienne's here, uh, background here. So I also non-technical background. Um, I uh, used to work in finance um, and business uh, just in, in general. Um, before I got involved in the startup uh, world a few years ago. So um, so people that are making career transitions, um, I, you know, I think that uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a hard time. And I know what, you're, what you might be going through. Um, I didn't move to Sydney, but I did move to New York in a suitcase. Um, and uh, I've uh, you know, previously worked at Techstars um, in part of one of their programs, and then for a French email startup called Mailjet uh, before working at Trello. Um, I'm not a product manager, um, and I have never held that role. So there's like a caveat to what we're talking about here. But in my role um, in partnerships, I work with companies like Zendesk and a lot of other companies that are building on Trello's platform. And it involves a lot of product work. Um, so I work with our product team, but I also work with the product teams of all of our partners on how uh, what they're actually designing. Um, and so I'm hearing from Trello users about what they uh, want to see Trello do um, and work with those partners to help to um, bring um, integrations that do those things. Um, so uh, a lot of product work involved there. Great. And then um, the purpose of tonight, we wanted to have a really honest, more fireside chat style. Um, this talk actually uh, was born in New York. Uh, Anthony and I had had met for coffee at the Trello office, and we started talking about the future of customer experience and what that looks like. So tonight we're going to be talking about the relationship between marketing, product, and your customer support team. Um, that's why Zendesk and Trello are both here. Um, we spend a lot of time with our customers really understanding what's the future of customer experience and, and what does that mean for product managers. And I think more specifically, as we you know, either are or aim to become a product manager, how do we make sure that in every conversation we're really thinking about the customer and we essentially become customer obsessed for the long term? So one of the things that we'll talk a lot about tonight is customer feedback and, and why that's a gift. Um, you know, as you start to get more and more user feedback, these are customers who are really engaged and they're using your product. But one of the challenges that you'll learn as a product manager is you have to be very strategic in understanding what feedback do we take on board and, and do we use to inform future features? And then what feedback do we kind of listen to but still have authority over our product and, and build the product that we really want to have? So one of the great things about product, about you know, contact with our customers is that no business plan survives it. No product survives first contact with customers. No feature. And one of the things we have to really think about is from a business standpoint, there are a lot of folks internally that will say they own the relationship of the customer. And what we mean by that is you know, throughout your, your journey as a company, whether you're a two-person startup or whether you're you know, a Fortune 500 company, customers will always get feedback. So um, what that means from a marketing standpoint is you might get a lot of feedback on social media. It might be negative, positive feedback about, about your product or your experience. 
Um, on the product side of things, I think in early days, you'll get a lot of feedback from power users. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Like, how do we really determine, you know, when early users give us feedback, how much of that is signal versus noise? So we'll, we'll help you think about, like, how do we filter through that feedback and how do we make sure we're building the product in a very strategic way? Yeah, so as we, you know, kind of think about um, you know this kind of question about uh, how do we think about more more about the customer as a part of the the conversation it's like everybody is involved in that process at a company um, and the problem is that you know if everybody owns it nobody owns it right um, but you, know, you get all of these competing um, people uh, that have you're hearing from the customer at some point um, you know through the through the process and you so you have uh, product teams that are thinking about you know how to make you know, the product do something in particular or um, you have the management team that are trying to figure out how to make the product monetize and you know get money from these customers right um, the marketing team that's um, you know trying to trying to figure these things out and you're getting all of the all of these pieces of feedback and, and each one of these um, these groups own own a part of that experience in a, in a real way um, so you know thinking a, a little bit about that um, how do these teams um, and how do we as companies uh, either, and, and like you know, Brianna was saying, you know, sometimes you know, we work at very large companies, other times we might work at like very small companies, but um, you know, how do we as organizations maybe is a better way to say it, uh, you know, actually approach um, listening to what the customer is asking for and um, build better product as a result? This is one of my favorite photos. I think this is pretty funny. So oftentimes what you hear, I think specifically um, if you're reading a lot about product management, um, there's this term about being customer obsessed. And I think a lot of times it's a little bit of a buzzword and we're not quite sure how to implement that. Um, I think in the, you know, in the early days of a startup, asking for customer feedback can be really scary. And I think it's scary for a couple of reasons. So you know, you, you have your first few customers, you want to make them happy, um, and what oftentimes will happen is you can over-optimize based on this early feedback from users. So what we're gonna talk about today is you know, how do you stay customer obsessed, which doesn't mean that you are necessarily um, building for the customer, but rather as you're in conversations with marketing or with customer support or as you're really mapping out your product, how do you make sure that you're making the right decisions for your customer? And whether that's you know early users, but also like who is your ideal customer? So we'll talk a lot about that. So here's an example. Um, this is sort of the typical customer journey. So oftentimes, you know, a customer will reach out to you with feedback across a number of channels. That could be anything from email to Facebook Messenger. I think a lot of times, uh, if you hear from customers on Twitter, it tends to be more of a, a negative connotation. But you know, as we're building out our products, we have to expect we're going to get a lot of feedback. And we're going to get it across a lot of channels. So historically, um, the way this works is you know, oftentimes you'll get feedback from a lot of different channels. Um, you'll have a, a central view. So Zendesk is a way of doing this, where basically you're pulling in feedback from all channels. And then you have someone on the other end. So generally, that's a support agent. Um, if you have your own startup, then likely you, know, you as a founder will be listening to all of this feedback and responding. But there's technically um, you know, a framework for really filtering through this feedback. So whether that's a ticket or you know, a shared inbox, that feedback needs to be shared with other teams. So generally, that gets shared to marketing, product, and support. And the great thing about the product team, and I think specifically as a product manager, is you know, if you want to become truly customer obsessed, you have to really understand how each team is going to use the feedback. So from a marketing standpoint, you know, marketing wants to make sure that their messaging and what they're taking to market is accurate. So that's where you'll work very closely with the product marketing team to make sure that you're taking in these insights and really building messaging that makes a lot of sense for the end user. Um, from a product standpoint, you know, this is where you get things like feature requests, which we'll talk about one of our mutual customers and how they think about feature requests. But it's important to really start to categorize like of all the things that our customers are saying, like what are the key points that you know a, a lot of this feedback comes down to? It might be feedback on your web experience, 
or more, more or less your digital experience, but it could also be really early, early product feedback. So one of our, one of a, a good anecdote that I have is one of our customers is Allbirds. So how many of you guys have heard of Allbirds? Is anyone wearing Allbirds? Not tonight. Okay, so their office is actually um, next door. They're here in San Francisco. And the great thing about Allbirds is, you know, they started out very early using Zendesk, but not in a, in a negative way where they had a lot of negative feedback coming in and they were, you know, responding to just inbound. They were actually proactively engaging with early users to say, you know, what, are you th what do you think about our product? How can we improve the overall like physical product to make this better? Um, and they have, you know, multiple iterations and, and early versions of the shoe. And a lot of that was based on very, very early feedback from the customer. So that was a mix of the marketing team, you know, the, the product manager, which in this case is more of a, a physical product designer. And then the third person is the support person who basically acts as the, the eyes and the ears for the customer. Um, and then, you know, from a product standpoint, a lot of times with feedback and what we'll talk about tonight is, you know, how do you really size up the opportunity? So as you start getting a lot of feedback, it's really important to figure out, you know, of all of these pieces of feedback, what changes can we make to really improve the overall, you know, business and performance? So who here uses Trello? Great. A lot of people there. That's awesome. Um, this is not, uh, for those of you who don't use Trello, this is not meant to be an advertisement for Trello. But what I want to show is just as you know, Brianna was talking about, um, you've got all of these, you know, all of this customer input that's coming in from all of these places. Um, in that process, there has to be at some point a way that you actually um, categorize and prioritize some of these things. And, um, so it's really great to have a place to do that. And whether that's in Trello or that's in another tool or um, you know, wherever that is, um, you know, this is, uh, we want to show an example of kind of what that is. So uh, one of uh, the companies, uh, Brianna and I were you know, talking with uh, Peloton, um, we recently did a webinar with, uh, showed us one of their boards that they use internally uh, to take that feedback that they're getting from Zendesk, that they're getting from their users, um, and actually helping to get that uh, in, a, in a space that they can start visualizing it. Um, and the important part is that once it's in that space, then they can start sharing that across the organization in a really interesting way. And so you know, the team, team here in this case is all on Trello. And so they can say um, to you know, somebody in the marketing or an executive or somebody on the product team or engineering team or whatever that team is, um, here are some of the issues um, or feature requests that our, our users are having. This is some part of their pain. And so going through that, you know, they created a list for software, for the hardware uh, feature requests, mobile app sales, uh, kind of continuing to go on there, allowing them to uh, really, um, you know, say, you know, visualize here are the issues. Um, at a certain point, they'll start bringing in all of those Zendesk issues and attaching them, so then you'll get a sense of priority um, to them in some ways. And, and some people might, uh, from the product team or engineering team, might take a look at this and be like, oh, that's an easy fix, and they, you know, want to take that. But it really first has to get to somewhere that the entire team can see that. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of those best practices as well. So um, we wanted this to be uh, our talk to include some of the uh, anecdotal experiences that we've had in our roles and at our companies. Um, and some, of the, some ideas is like, as you're thinking about this um, in, in your organizations today or future organizations, ways that you can get started in building a, a culture of being customer obsessed. So uh, the first way um, is to start measuring. Um, I think that uh, what we'll both say and you know, some of the other ones is that like num you know, assigning numbers to things can sometimes um, create distance between you and the, the customer. Um, but it is an important, so it's, it's not the thing that should be leading the customer's voice, but it's one of the important elements of that. And also to see how, how the changes that you're making over time, and whether or not that they're actually having the impact that you're, that you're uh, hoping for. Um, so I'm sure that um, some of you are uh, familiar with uh, CSAT um, and NPS. Um, they're two different measures, but you know, customer satisfaction and net promoter. Um, as, uh, as ways that you can start 
um, you know, bringing in some of that measurement as far as how, you know, what people um, are, are saying um, about, uh, about your product and their experience with it. Um, creating a baseline for that is, uh, is really important so you can start seeing those, uh, that impact. Um, and another thing you know, is in there as well is just like having a system to tag and report on issues. So like if you're in Zendesk or you know, some other tools saying, okay, these issue, this feature request um, actually relates to, you know, or, you know, flows into this other kind of greater issue. And, and so part of that is like, first you have to create a name. You have to name what the issue is or the feature request. And then you actually, um, by tagging things, um, you can actually start assigning them to those like named features um, and then also start reporting on them at a certain point. Quick question. How many of you guys are in B2B? Okay, about, about 50%. Um, what's really interesting is I think a lot of times I tend to hear CSAT and NPS more so in B2B. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that um, I know on, on the Zendesk side of things, like our CSAT score is one of our core value props. So as we're starting to see um, a very competitive landscape, um, we have competitors on the high end, you know, as we're moving up market. But, you know, I think also we, we keep in mind the fact that there are a lot of low end competitors that, you know, are starting to pop up over even, I would say, the last 12 months. And one of the interesting things is, you know, as you start to build a company or even as you start to build a product within a company, your CSAT and your NPS will become a core value prop. So when you send your sales team into very competitive conversations or, you know, when you're, when you're trying to win new business, you know, prospects are going to ask you, you know, what do your customers say about you? You know, they either want to see qualitative customer stories or oftentimes they want to see that CSAT number to get a really good sense for, you know, once I sign a contract or once I start working with you, what is that experience going to look like? Like, what does your customer success team look like? How are you going to support me for the long term? So I think it's really interesting to see that, you know, moving beyond taking care of your current customers, you can also start to use these metrics to really use them as basically a growth lever for future customers. Yeah, like service is part of the, the product. Really. Yeah, service becomes part of the product. And I think what we're seeing in today's world is that, you know, whether you're B2B or B2C, you're always going to have low-end competitors. There's always going to be cheaper products and cheaper services. So one of your core differentiators will oftentimes be how do you listen to your customers and how do you treat them long term? So that becomes more of a retention conversation. So the next thing that we, we've been talking a lot about is um, building customer empathy across the organization. So one of the, the great things about, I would say, Zendesk and Trello is we, we both have very similar cultures. And one of the things that we really try to instill in all of our employees is a really strong sense of empathy. Um, and what I mean by that is we want to make sure that we're taking time to listen to all of our customers. So you're getting a lot of quantitative feedback. We do a lot of surveys and that, you know, we get our NPS and our CSAT score. But more importantly, we take time to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So what this looks like at Zendesk is we do something called customer conversations. So once a month, we'll have basically a lunch and learn. Um, everyone across the company will come and one of our customers will, will come and share basically their Zendesk journey. So the purpose of this is to really learn the ins and outs of their business. And more importantly, we really encourage them to be very raw and honest. So if they have called and had you know, a longer wait time or if they've had any sort of issues with our product, we have this format where we want them to be very raw and honest. Um, and the whole point of this exercise is to really build customer empathy across the organization and to really create a community where, you know, if we are building a product, we have a face to those customers. Yeah. And similarly at Trello, we have something that we call Cafe Trello that just actually somewhat recently started. And as we've kind of grown and the company's grown, there's a lot of new people there. Um, you know, trying to you know get away from some of the numbers and bring everybody like right up there to some individual users. 
like you said, understand um, their their pains, um, their use cases. You know, we don't know how people use Trello. Um, there's so many different ways. Um, so uh, just having somebody show us uh, their Trello boards is actually a, a, a really uh, delightful and amazing team for thing for our team because you see all of these new ways that people use Trello that you never even thought of, and so um, and the. Everybody at the company is is uh, invited to that. Um, so again, you have people across various roles that actually have the power to affect this person's experience. And that might be that somebody's saying, oh, I love this. And they're like, that's amazing, but we can make it even better. Let's make it even better for them. Or someone does say, we hate this. And we're like, okay, like maybe we didn't quite understand like when people were writing back in those NPS surveys that they didn't like that. Like, hearing you know Susie you know say that and hearing how painful and what her workaround is for that experience makes me really much more motivated to make that change and so I think that that you know really getting somebody uh, to come and talk to talk to you and, and I think that at you know really small companies your first you know products that can be done as well um, and I think you know instilling that you know really early on um, and I'd like to see more really big companies companies do that um, one of the ways you can do that at scale, even if you're not doing that in like the kind of uh, uh, video chat, video call, or come into our office and we're going to stream this out to everybody kind of way, is um, you know what companies like Peloton have done, um, and Atlassian actually does this as well, is this voice of the member, voice of the customer email um, that goes out and a report that goes out to the entire organization. Um, so you know I get them on my phone and I and I quickly can look through and see like this is what people are saying about um, your products and. We get it for every single product um, you know, right now. And I think that, that uh, hear, hearing those quotes or feeling the people behind those quotes is, um, is really uh, a powerful, uh, powerful experience. So another thing that we've done um, at Trello uh, is trying to uh, bring, bring community um, into the uh, customer equation. Uh, Probably about a year ago, we launched our own Slack community. Um, it seems like uh, the product school here does has their uh, own Slack community as well, and I think that so it's not you know exactly a novel thing. Um, we first started inviting some of our most passionate users, like the people that would engage with us on Twitter, the people that um, you know all that have written in to us and tell, you know, to, told us like wrote, written these love letters about Trello, um, and then slowly um, started to build that community. Um, and then at a certain point, I think we made it public. And it's up to a few thousand people in that Slack community now, um, which has been really great. Uh, and you know, it's not just our community manager that's in there or, these, uh, or the people that are part of the Trello community that are talking to one another. You know, there's you know, channels about everything um, in there. But uh, everybody across the organization has access to that, and they jump in. And so um, when our PMs want to, uh, you know, uh, do some user testing, or they want to um, ask, like, you know, we recently asked about power-ups, which are the like, kind of Trello integrations. Um, you know, what, what power-ups do you want to see? And just, like, generated this conversation. And it's like, here's real people that are asking for this stuff, and we have people that we can ask, you know, follow-on questions to. Uh, so it's been, like, a really great community for us. I um, mean, we, you know, there's people that have issues and all that, and our, our team jumps in there and, so, and re re responds to that. And everybody feels empowered to, to do that. It's not like, okay, that's the community teams like thing um, everybody wants to be a part of that and and wants to do that and, and one of the things is really led to a delightful experience for um, for users like can't believe that this like the CEO from Trello is like jumping in and chatting with them in this community um, or the person that you know runs this um, this part of the product is, is talking to them and like actually listening to them um, so that kind of access has really been been great um, and you know, part of that also is around beta users. Um, so we have gotten more and more uh, interested in, in kind of uh, exposing what we're working on to users. And um, you kind of think about that like before, like rather than listen to them when they have a support experience and you know get you know really close to the user then or you know uh, after years of using Trello, like let's get that you know, voice of the um, that voice into the product discussion earlier. Let's show this to them. Let's hear what they like whether they're excited about it or whether they have issues with it, and like help our users shape their product um, in in a real way. 
Um, one of the interesting things about community as well is I think there's a huge opportunity to invest and spend time with your non-power users. And what I mean by that is spend time with people who are new to your product. They're going to have a really fresh take. Um, they're going to provide very different insights. And I think what's really interesting is a lot of times um, we will spend a lot of money on user acquisition, but I would say a lot of companies don't in invest enough in terms of like onboarding and nurture. So I think in terms of building community, there's a huge opportunity to, to basically leverage the same best practices that we use for power users, like Slack channels, you know, bringing customers in to have customer conversations or user groups, um, but invite your non-power users. You know, I think if you're in B2B SaaS, it's really interesting to spend time with expired trialers. Start to understand, you know, if someone has taken the time to sign up for your product and they've used it for a couple weeks, you know, spend some time with them and understand, you know, why didn't they convert to paid? Um, I think that's a, a huge opportunity specifically in, in B2B SaaS, but I think there's a lot of best practices that we're seeing in you know, consumer that's kind of changing the way that we do things. So um, I'll use a, a couple anecdotes. I mentioned Allbirds earlier. Um, I think Away, the luggage company, is also very interesting. There's a lot of new direct-to-consumer companies where they're changing an entire sort of perception of you know, their brand or their product, Away is much more than just a suitcase. Um, if you think about it, they're really creating a, a community and an experience. So I think that's where we're heading in terms of not only B2B SaaS as far as like building these Slack communities and having more like in-depth user conferences, but on the B2C side, we are seeing that people really want community and they want to feel connected to the products that they're buying and they want to feel that it's, it's more than just buying a suitcase or, you know, Warby Parker is more than just buying glasses, cheap glasses at that. It's more about how are you creating a differentiated experience and how do you have a real community and connection that encourages people to become a loyal um, or power user. Um, and I think that's, that's really interesting because it's something that your competitors can't copy. So um, at Zendesk, we spend a lot of time with our startups, but we also spend a lot of time with our enterprise customers. And we hear a lot of times from enterprise that they're looking to startups, you know, they're looking to the small startups in San Francisco to understand what's the future of our industry and how can we build our product in a way that's lean and nimble. And, you know, I think there's a lot of great things to be said about product school because it's basically once you understand like this PM mindset and how you can become customer obsessed, like this is something you can take to any company. It's, it's a really interesting model to think about like how do you get customer feedback early and how do you really use it to like implement and move quickly when it comes to, you know, your product. And then the final piece of advice here um, is ways that you can think about getting started is to create a product council and and um, you know what kind of what is that? Um, I think that uh, there's you know, different ways that this can be structured at other company at, at you know, various companies, um, but a part of, like kind of the core of it to me is bringing together a cross-functional group of people um, to have conversations about where the product is and where it's going. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think, uh, you know, when you're, in, when, when you're in product and you're, you know, kind of, you decide what you're going to build and you're going to go build it, um, you know, sometimes it can be very, uh, it can be easy to uh, lose little things along the way that when you, the product ends up getting built, it's the wrong thing. Um, and so by bringing in people from support, um, that were maybe the first people to hear about that issue, um, or the marketing team that um, you know are getting the blog comments or the social media, um, you know, around those requests or those bugs. Bring them into the conversation. Help them, um, you know, one uh, understand uh, why the product uh, was designed in the way that it was. Um, and so there's like part of it is like building um, kind of some consensus uh, like around you know what why that solution. Um, but the other is letting them influence um, that as well during that process. Um, and so 
you know, Trello, we um, created a, a product council that is is around some of this, um, you know, to expose uh, things that the product team or is is working on to others, uh, kind of across a cross functional group. Part of that is to um, you know, to to feed back uh, that like what um, you know, other people you know that that know you know what that that pain is and and get that into the product. Um, but also part of it, you know, kind of is in the opposite is um, it kind of retaining what is Trello. Um, and uh, as the team has grown and we have uh, new people and uh, we have an enterprise product now and, and all this, like, uh, I think that it can be uh, easy for things to um, spiral uh, out of control. And uh, we really, uh, if you've used Trello before, um, you know, probably use it. And if you've used it two years ago, you probably haven't seen a whole lot of changes. And that's, you know, very intentional. And so how do we do things that uh, feel what we call Trello-y? And so that's part of, you know, what we, what we built there and in, in allowing other people to um, do that. Now, also, you know, by the way, is that uh, I think that Product councils, if they're done right, do not make product managers do what to like. You know, this is not product by decision, um, but it's a way for um, those product managers to get feedback. Um, and whether they use it or not, it's up to them. Um, they still have the ultimate authority over where, the, where that product goes, um, but it allows them to have um, feedback from others, and other, others on the team in a, in a way that um, can help influence the product in a positive way. So, I don't know, you know how quickly we re really went through that, but um, I, I hope that you found that uh, that helpful. Uh, I really, like I said, w wanted to kind of open this more up to a conversation Q and A. Q &A. Uh, we've got some of the uh, uh, Slido. Slido. Um, how do you convert NPS into an action item? Um, Totally transparently, I'm, I, I don't work that much with NPS, um, Brian. I don't know if you do uh, as well, but um, I think that you know over time um, with those NPS scores and the feedback that you get about why people rate that, um, it's uh, you, know, you start to see those patterns if you are tagging and starting to like actually categorize what those responses are. You name the issue, okay? That's you know, people having um, you know an issue with like the the product not doing something that they want it to be able to do. You name that issue and you start to categorize those um, those pieces of feedback um, and actually you know showing that that weight that they that they gave. Um, so. Uh, what I think ultimately happens is that those things over time they start to bubble up, um, and you start seeing those in your you know your uh, voice of the customer um, conversations. You start seeing more and more of those um, uh, the, those same things uh, to get on the radar, and it's like and eventually I think that somebody says, okay, well we got to take a look at what that is. Um, maybe they don't have an issue quite with that. We have a you know different solution that we have to solve that issue uh, that that issue, but um, you start seeing some of those patterns. Did you ever? Just, uh, just clarifying. Yep. Just my question to understand. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the question was: Is the narrative more important than the NPS number? And I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's you know really really what it is. That's where you get that that value. Um, if you um, can address the narrative, the NPS number is going to change. Yeah. Uh, um, so other question, uh, other questions in the room um, that we can take, or should we just go? Yeah, go ahead. You know? <laughs> yeah, so the question was managing requests and sp specific around frequently asked questions, it seems like. So a lot of times, um, and, and this is something that Peloton does really well, I think generally you can divide it into specific categories. You're either getting feedback on your core product, you're getting feedback on, like if you're selling, selling a good, it might be feedback on, on the physical product. Um, and then if you're on the B2B side, you know, it might be around like account management, something like that. So historically, you know, I think if you're using, um, we'll use Zendesk and Trello as, as an example, but if you're, if you're, you know, bringing in all of those um, pieces of customer feedback in a central view, you should be able to tag them. And I think one interesting way that I've been thinking about, you know, tagging these sort of inbound pieces of feedback is using 
um, either ones like tagging it either manual or automated. And what I mean by that is if you're seeing a lot of questions that are um, duplicates, you know, is there a way for you to automate that response? So for example, um, we see a lot of customers that are building like a self-serve knowledge base. So if you can automate a lot of those, you know, frequently asked questions, you're going to increase your average response time. You're also able to create um, basically an FAQs on your website, which is going to help your customer get answers a lot faster. Um, and then it helps your team really kind of bubble up any sort of frequent themes that are that are coming up. I think a lot of times, you know, if you're at a startup or in the early days, a lot of times it's really core like product related feedback. You know, your customers are going to be the first ones that catch any bug. They're going to be the first ones that have really raw and honest feedback on the the physical product itself. So I think the more that you can kind of categorize it and automate it, the better, um, and then make sure that you're, you're bubbling up any sort of themes that you're seeing. Just to add to that, I, I really think that doing some of these things at scale can be really hard. Um, and I think that pushing um, individual teams uh, to uh, take ownership of what they own um, helps to break that scale into like more manageable pieces. You have a question? Yeah, so the question was how do you uh, prioritize the quantitative and the qualitative uh, feedback? Um, I, I, I think that eventually like there is a significant overlap between the two, two pieces. The quantitative feedback is pointing to, it, there, there's a qualitative feedback underlying the quantitative feedback, right? Um, and so uh, when you see, um, you know, on some of those metric you know, kind of driven uh, things there, like we often ask people um, if they are willing uh, to uh, to answer like some follow up questions if we have them, um, and surprisingly, a lot of people are they do want to talk about that you know challenge that they had, um, and so as soon as we like start seeing that quantitative feedback you know, is, is a certain direction on something, um, we'll have a pool of some people we can go follow up with and get more qualitative, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think this is kind of, the, sorry, the question is like, how do you um, uh, deal with high volumes of verbatims? And I think kind of uh, is similar to this question at scale is um, breaking, breaking it down. So for an example, um, with the Trello Power Ups platform, um, I still go through those and look at them all the time uh, because I'm the person that I feel or uh, that I think can best address the issues that people have. And the issues can be that like, hey, I want this integration um, or I wish that Trello did this. And so some of that um, is product feedback that I don't have control over. And I um, it, make that clear to, like, to, um, to the product team and like, kind of pass that along. But the things that I do, I, I really do go through and I, I tag them. Um, and we have some automation set up kind of similar to what Bree was saying. But um, if I had to do that, uh, if there was a team that had to do that for like, all of Trello, I think that, uh, we would, uh, that like, we wouldn't have enough people to do, do all of that. Next question, so how do you include customer feedback and also internal requests into the sequence of work items um, in a way that still delivers plan features? So I think, as we mentioned before, I think what's really interesting about customer feedback is you know, your customers are actively using your product. Um, they're sort of the, the first you know, beta users. And, and any sort of issues that come up, um, they're going to be things that for the most part you're aware of. I think you know, a lot of times what our support team will say is a lot of these feature requests or a lot of the questions that we're getting through from our customers, they're things that are on our roadmap and we're getting to them as soon as possible. I think what's great about kind of listening and, and, and categorizing and making sure that we're addressing these things is the more customers that really you know, amplify what they're looking for and really kind of echo those feature requests, like that does help us in terms of prioritization. But I would say for the most part, like 
especially if you're a customer obsessed PM, you can sort of anticipate any sort of questions that are going to come through from your customer. Um, and oftentimes, you know, it all comes down to the number of engineers that you have or, you know, prioritization internally. But I think like as you become, you know, a better and better PM, you can basically, you know, instantly imagine, okay, like we're going to anticipate this feedback that's going to come in. Here's the response and here's, you know, where it sits on our current roadmap. Yeah, and I think that um, it like transparently, like at Trello, I don't think we've quite figured this out, um, and I, because I think that it's hard. So I wish that I had a better answer for for all of you, but I, I really think that um, figuring out um, how to fit this uh, into like planned features um, can often be a challenge. Um, but I do think that some of the kind of um, behaviors that we were talking about today about um, having like these uh, customer interviews and those types of things um, like really help to uh, allow the customer voice to come through in a way that doesn't feel at conflict with the, the roadmap, if that makes sense. Um, next question is for, for me here. As partnerships lead, how do you fit feature requests into the PM's list and scheduling? Um, uh, I, I'm sure that people have uh, a greater challenge um, at this than, uh, than I do. I, I feel very fortunate. Uh, the uh, PM who uh, leads the Trello platform um, actually uh, worked with a lot of the partners prior to me um, to joining. Um, and he uh, is, has been just really incredible to work with uh, because he really understands the value that uh, bringing on new partners and what the partners um, are, are looking for um, onto the platform is um, uh, something that I think that he has a very, very high empathy for, which puts me, I think, in a really unique situation. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, like, uh, ultimately, um, you know, in the, in the platform side of the, the PM, um, the platform doesn't exist um, unless developers are really happy. Um, and so, and uh, so the, uh, w within the PM team, uh, our developer advocate and the documentation around our APIs all sits under that, you know, that, uh, that, that product owner. Um, the actual like, you know, performance of the APIs and, and all of that also, also there. And then I you know, work uh, you know, really closely in helping to feed that, uh, feed that back. Um, but again, some of the, some of the uh, practices uh, that we have there around like the Slack community. Um, we have one of those for like our entire uh, user base. Um, and we actually have a power ups channel in there. Uh, we actually have a separate one for our partners. Um, and uh, it's probably one of the most, ex I think, interesting things that we've done with our partners. Um, in that, like I think, you know, I work with a lot of other other partners, and how they do integrations. Um, we have these uh, constant com conversations in Slack between our team and theirs. Um, that uh, you know, when those developers are having issues with um, you know, so how something is working, like our the person that does the documentation is is listening to say, okay, is this a documentation issue? Um, the engineers are that there to say, okay, is this something that we can solve? Um, and so they're close enough to that customer voice, which in, in our case is the, is the partners, uh, that they're hearing it as well. So um, yeah, really kind of practicing what, what we were preaching there. I can speak to that a little bit on the Zenda side of things. Um, I think the, the B2B SaaS landscape is very interesting these days. Um, and you know, we, can, we have an amazing core product, but most importantly, we know that our integrations need to be world class specifically if we want to compete up market. So, um, you know, I think a lot of times Anthony and I will joke or I'll joke with other partners, like we're not quite sure where our team ends and theirs begins because um, we all have the same goals and we want to provide an amazing customer experience. So if a Trello customer is using, you know, Zendesk or a Zendesk customer is using Trello, like they're one, it's the same customer and we have a shared vision across the board. So the way that that works from sort of a, a partnership slash PM standpoint is that we need to make sure that everything we're building connects with the technology that you have already. So whether that's um, an integration to Trello or, you know, your current CRM or any tracking analytics, 
Like the, the, the role of a partner is very much cross-functional and I think we're all sharing the same customers. So it becomes a really, really exciting role. And I think it's a really exciting time in tech as well, where, you know, we are constantly being challenged by our partners to build faster and to build deeper integrations. And, you know, I think the great thing about, you know, the world of, of SaaS as well is like developers are super smart and, you know, our buyers are really smart people. And, you know, we're, yes, Zendesk is going after a core support buyer, but we need to make sure everything we're building is suitable for a CIO. It's approved by you know, a chief product officer. So we're, we're getting a lot more technical. And I think it's really cool to see that, like, the world of, like, partnerships is now, like, we're actually just, like, all building together for the purpose of improving the customer experience. This is a great question. So this is kind of where it all got started. So how do you filter valuable feedback from the noise? Um, and I think that in early days, you know, you might not have a, a real prioritization framework for this. I think, you know, if you're a two-man company, uh, if you're in a very early startup, then, you know, part of this is just taking in all of the feedback. Like, you want to hear as much about your product as possible because that's going to help you iterate and improve over time. Um, what's interesting is, you know, as you become more mature as a company, Zendesk, for example, we've been around for 10 years and, you know, we're constantly iterating on our core product. But most importantly, you need to have a really strong vision for where you want your product to go. So if we only spoke to our power users, they would likely say, don't change your product. We love it. But, you know, internally we knew like, hey, we're, we're 10 years old. Um, we recently rebranded last year and we've launched a series of new products. And part of that was, you know, a strategic, a strategic decision and a vision for our product where we say our power users aren't asking for this, but we want to go one, you know, one, two, five steps beyond and say this is what we need to build to provide the best possible experience. So I think it really depends on like the, the stage that you're at as a company. And what's really interesting is, you know, I, I come from a performance marketing background and transitioned into to a PM. So I'm constantly looking for what can we do that can scale and what can we do that, you know, can be automated as quickly as possible. And I think this is one of those topics where it's not something that you can potentially, you know, automate, outsource. It's basically you, you have to spend time and really take in the feedback and then make those strategic decisions that, you know, are best for your customer. Sorry, I'm just going to take the contrarian view to that really quickly is that like that question is like why we're all here, right? I mean, this is, um, you know, that, that's an art, um, separating the signal from the noise, understanding when to listen and when to ignore. Like, you, know, you, you know, can hear all sorts of stories in, in the Bay Area about people that, you know, t people said, oh, that's a terrible idea and gave them, like, this feedback. They, you know, strongly believed in that vision. Um, and, uh, you know, if we listen to, you know, some of our users, they would ask us for, Gantt charts and for burn down charts and all these like you know other types of things that they want Trello to do they want to make it into their project management tool and we're um, you know, that's not what we are um, we uh, you can do project management on Trello but um, it's so much more than that and so. Uh, uh, that that signal, I think, um, can feel so like crisp and clear, um, and sometimes, and you still um, have to maybe ignore it. And so, I think that that's kind of why why we're all here is like figuring out how to take the signal of what the pain is in the um, in the world that um, we think that our products can solve, and, um, and and trying to filter everything else out. So, it's hard to do. Um, this question from Steve, how, how have you uh, tried capturing and categorizing problem requests um, to avoid early assumptions? Um, I have not. Um, that sounds really interesting, though. I can absolutely see um, why uh, that uh, could lead to um, the assumptions being built into the product from day one. Do you do anything like that at Zendesk? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Yeah, I think that's a, a great, great question. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Um, how do you deal with conflict, uh, conflicting user feedback, uh, and how do you prioritize various needs? Yeah, that yeah, kind of speaking a little bit to that Trello um, experience. You know, we have so many um, different users, people using Trello at home and at work, um, at small companies and large companies, in every single role. Um, 
and it's made it really, um, I think it's made it really hard, but um, in, I think that the, the vision has always to be something that anybody can use for anything and um, sticking to that vision and uh, being ruthless around reducing complexity, um, not allowing uh, kind of more advanced features to come into the uh, product experience um, early on. Um, we built power-ups as a way to uh, people to extend the value um, or ex extend the kind of the use of that uh, of Trello for their per your, their unique use case, um, and uh, putting that uh, in uh, the integrations and power-ups rather than trying to uh, trying to uh, scare um, scare anybody away when they first getting started. Like, ah, what are all these things that I'm like supposed to be adding on to my product? Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think we get conflicting user feedback all the time. Um, I th I, we know what we want to do with, with Trello, and um, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, we've, we've made mistakes. Um, you know, we have uh, really held to our guns on something and, and not listened to um, user feedback, and, and, it's, and eventually you know, kind of come to realize that because uh, they just don't go away. Um, either you start losing customers <laughs> or they start getting louder. Um, so I think that... Um, that's, that's you know, some of our experience. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think with conflicting feedback, a lot of times you have to go one or two layers deeper. So if, you know, if uh, a user comes to you and says, I don't like your product, like, is that sufficient feedback? Not really. It's not very actionable. So it's almost like how do you, how do you basically distill it down into a core insight? And how does that core insight tie back to your broader strategy. So I think one of the things, you know, that you learn over time as a product manager is you have to go really deep. So you have to go deep on the product, but you know, in parallel, you also have to go very deep on the user and your understanding of the user will grow over time. Um, I think when you spend more time with pro like the more, the more time you spend at a company, the more you know deep you go in terms of you know not only not only understanding of the product, but also like you'll just be in meetings with amazing PMs who know the ins and outs of the user, and the reason for that is they've spent a lot of time understanding you know motivations and understanding and anticipating any sort of challenges or feedback that's going to come up, and I think that's definitely a learned skill, um, and I think whether you're a product manager now or you know, if you've had a lot of exposure to product managers, you can definitely tell when someone is customer obsessed. And a lot of times that really comes down to spending a lot of time with the user and not just taking the feedback at face value, but really like digging into what are the motivations and what have been the actions that have caused that, that piece of feedback. Thank you. Um, so uh, this question on top, uh, seems to me that support cases are a bit biased to customers with issue um, issues. How do you adjust cases uh, insight to ensure actions are representative, um, uh, representative of the general audience? Um, uh, I, I don't, again, I work in the uh, either the support or the product side, uh, but I think that um, I, I, I tend to agree with this. Like sometimes you are going to uh, hear uh, questions or hear most of the the loudest voices, kind of the squeakiest wheel, are gonna like end up trying to you know drive what that that is. Um, I think that uh, uh, balancing that out with one, what your product vision is, um, to uh, some of the uh, some opportunities for positive experiences, um, and he hearing from people about what they love about your product and some of that community, um, and in other case studies, uh, ultimately balances some of that out. Um, we do get love letters, though, in support. Um, so we get people writing in all the time that tell us, uh, um, you know, how, how great something was, um, and, uh, and and so that also helps to uh, to validate, um, you know, when things are going well, what the, what they're really um, latching onto. Um, and then final question: Do you weigh feedback based on where it comes from, bigger, more important customers versus new and smaller ones? Um, another really great question. Um, I think that. Uh, the, 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 the answer for, for us is it really depends. Um, there are things that uh, we have um, fixed um, that definitely, like, I think have been related to pains that specific types of, uh, of uh, larger customers have, have had. Um, but I think that would, by having uh, a separate product, uh, Trello Enterprise, like has solved that for them um, rather than uh, having to worry about uh, for everybody else. But uh, I think that really goes back to the um, uh, 
you know, Trello is for anything, um, that we uh, often, like uh, you know, just as an anecdote, there's a thing called a, a due dates in Trello, um, and uh, or maybe it's called calendar. But there's a like a um, you put a calendar date on on a card, um, and what's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't remember if it was there's a calendar power up and there's due dates, but there um, you, know, you put that date on there, and um, after the date would pass, it would just still show as being read. And and we were kind of you know, questioning, well, like, does everybody that puts a date on a card actually need to be marking something as being done? Um, and so the, I think the, that was like one of the examples that we had feedback from people that they want to mark things as done in Trello. And so over, like I think of course of months or maybe even years, like hadn't you know, figure out what the right solution was. And part of that was we weren't sure like whether everybody wanted to do that and didn't want to introduce something to Trello that would be um, like specific to one's, one kind of use case. And I think that, um, so ultimately we uh, realized that people, it's not necessarily about marking it done, it's more about that it said this red over do thing on it um, that was scaring people away from that data or like frustrated because like the date they had finished whatever it was or they um, that date um, it didn't need to be read it just the date had passed um, and so we allowed them ability to kind of you know to mark it as being done but more of as a way to like change the color um, and and uh, not just as specific to that use case so yeah I think um, when it comes to prioritizing feedback um, I would say that you know it depends on the size of the company and, and, and what your objectives are. I think that you will hear of companies that are you know moving up market or trying to sell a more premium good, and, and potentially they do prioritize feedback coming from larger companies. But I think it all comes down to tracking and measurements. So you know if you are like you said, if you're tagging all of your your inbound feedback and you're noticing trends, it all comes down to really identifying trends and really as a PM understanding what's going to drive the the greatest impact for the business and help you know the the widest kind of breadth of customers. So I think just anecdotally, you know Zendesk is in a very interesting position right now where, We've been around for 10 years and we're moving up market. So, you know, a lot of our core focus is really like taking over the enterprise. So a lot of the features and a lot of the things that we're building, like we are building more enterprise grade features. And, you know, we have to think about HIPAA compliance or a lot of these things that matter for big companies. But simultaneously, we, we also need to make sure that we're staying very close to startups and to our most innovative customers because if we're only building for upmarket, then we'll quickly become, you know, essentially SAP, Oracle, like we'll be one of those traditional tech companies, which, you know, all of us in this room are laughing, but, you know, that's the true story. Like we, as we move up market, we can't forget startups because startups are innovative and they'll challenge us in really like new and interesting ways because, you know, I think that the nature of a startup is to, to ask tough questions and to disrupt an industry. So there, you know, our, the feedback from startups definitely keeps us on our toes.